morning, everybody. I'm Richard Parr, and you are watching Sportachino. It is Friday, the 16th of December, 2016. I've got some bad news for you people, though. This is my last show of 2016. I'm taking a little Christmas break to refresh, refuel, and rejuvenate ahead of a massive year of sport in 2017. We will be back on January the 9th. But don't worry, we've got a massive show for you today. We've got so much to discuss. We're going to be talking about Brock Lesnar being banned by the UFC. We're going to look ahead to the huge matches in the English Premier League, including Manchester City versus Arsenal. We'll be giving away the book, Class of 92, by the Neville brothers, Paul Scholes, Nicky Butt, and Ryan Giggs. We're gonna announce who has won that competition today. We're also gonna do our product review, and we're gonna talk in depth about discrimination in football. All of that to come on today's Sportachino, but let's start the day with our morning sports headlines. Brock Lesnar has been suspended for one year and given a $250,000 fine for failing a drugs test. Luis Suarez has signed a new contract at Barcelona, keeping him at the club until 2021. Zinedine Zidane is critical of FIFA's new video technology following their 2-0 win over Club America of Mexico in the Club World Cup. And the Seattle Seahawks clinched the NFC West with a 24-3 win over the Los Angeles Rams. Today's episode is sponsor free. If you'd like to get involved with the show, drop us an email, sportsdesk at sportachino.com. But if you want to support our show, you can also buy some of our merchandise from sportachino.com. That would really help support our program. Lots of great stuff there, including mugs, t-shirts, and hoodies. All right, there is cricket going on in Chennai right now. Let's get a quick update. Well, England, having already lost the series, they're 3-0 down in this fifth and final test against India. They're at the crease, and Joe Root is unbeaten on 85. Moeen Ali, he is unbeaten on a half century as well on 52. They lost early wickets of Cook. He went for 10. Jennings went for 1. England 158 for 2. A pretty decent start from England. It's good to see Joe Root playing well. Lots of rumours going around right now that he could replace Alistair Cook pretty soon as the England captain. Facebook viewers, Periscope viewers, what do you think about all of that? Would that be a good decision for England? Is it time for a change? Let us know on all of these different pages. Also get involved in the conversation on Twitter. And we like to do that every single weekday morning with a brand new poll. Let's have a look at today's poll. Today we want to know who will win on Sunday between Manchester City and Arsenal Football Club. It's a big game on Sunday. It's not been going very well for Pep Guardiola so far at the Etihad. They did get a 2-0 win on Wednesday, but Arsenal, they got their first defeat since the start of the season when they lost 2-1 at Everton. So it's going to be a fascinating game on Sunday between Manchester City and Arsenal. Please give us your views on who you think might win that game. All right, big weekend in the Premier League. Let's have a look at everything that's going on on Saturday. So Chelsea made it 10 wins out of 10 in midweek and they're now away to Crystal Palace in the early kickoff on Saturday at Selhurst Park. Middlesbrough, they lost to Liverpool in midweek. They face Swansea. It's Stoke versus the champions. Leicester, can Leicester finally get an away win? They lost to Bournemouth in midweek. Sunderland face Watford. It's West Ham versus Hull. They got a home win this week and it's West Brom versus Manchester United who have started to improve recently. Two wins on the bounce for United. All right, let's have a look at what else is happening on Sunday. And it is a South Coast derby between Bournemouth and Southampton, of course. 
Bournemouth. They got that fantastic win against Liverpool recently. They also got that win over the champions Leicester. So it'll be interesting to see how they get on against their South Coast rival Southampton. It's Manchester City versus Arsenal. What a huge game that is. That's very, very interesting. And also Tottenham Hotspur, they faced Burnley on Sunday. That's not really a game I'm going to watch. That doesn't really interest me. What games interest you? We would love to hear from you on Sportachino this morning. Get involved in the conversation on the YouTube page, on, the YouTube page, on Facebook and on Periscope. It would be great to hear from you. All right, now moving on. We, we mentioned on all of our social media and everything like that that today we're going to be talking about discrimination in football. And that's because there are only three or minority ethnic managers in the top four leagues in English football right now. Brighton and Hove Albion's Chris Hewton, Keith Curl at Carlisle United, and Grimsby Town's Marcus Bignot. The former shadow sports minister, Chi Onwura, has called this, this an evidence of institutional failure. And many footballing figures, including former FA chairman Greg Dyke, have called for a version of the Rooney rule to be introduced. This would involve football clubs interviewing at least one black or minority ethnic candidate for senior co coaching roles. Sports journalist Michael McCann has produced a short documentary called The Ugly Side of the Beautiful Game, Discrimination in Football. And as part of his documentary, he spoke to the Cardiff City under-21 coach, Michael Johnson. Take a look at this. People say to me, well, you know, we've got, you know, there's no black managers. You tell me, you know, managers, there's managers and coaches that want to be, um, you know, in positions. It's just not happening. The statistics suggest change is needed. BME people represent 25% of all professional players and 14% of the population, but just 4.2% of all those in senior coaching positions and only 3.3% of first-team football league managers. Johnson has completed every single football coach and management qualification possible, including his pro licence, governance, FA coach educator, all FA youth modules and his LMA diploma in football management yet has applied for 40 jobs since his retirement and had just three interviews. The statistics show that there's clearly a problem with a lack of BME managers and coaches. What do you think are the reasons for that? Um, it's a good question. Um, because you do try and eliminate everything. Um, and I thought about, OK, it's not qualifications-wise. Um, and then you start to think, OK, it might be experience. And then it, it comes down to, it could be the colour of your skin. They don't know any better, you know, so you, sometimes, you know, the chief executives, the chairmen will go with somebody they feel more comfortable with, somebody who looks like them, talks like them, and sometimes that's not always the best decision or road to go down. Do you think enough is being done at the minute to encourage more BME managers and coaches? No, absolutely not. Um, there's still lots of work to be done. You know, you look at the current game right now, you know, I can count on one hand how many managers of colour are out there operating in the, the four levels of English football. Well, joining me now on Sportachino is the documentary maker of the, of the ugly side of the beautiful game, discrimination in football management. Sports journalist Michael McCann joins me live from his kitchen. Uh, Michael, I hear you've had a pretty late night with your uh, with your Christmas do. So delighted you were able to get up this morning because this is such an important topic to talk about, isn't it, Michael? Well, exactly. It's um, it makes for a bit of a contrast from a night out with my talk sport colleagues enjoying the festive season. This is a far more serious issue and uh, one that's certainly not as fun to discuss, but it needs to be discussed. So it's fantastic for you to get me on and again give a platform it's not really about me this in any shape or form I think it's the kind of journalism that we need to see more of really looking at issues in the game that might not be sexy as such but really need to be dug down into and examined in great detail so you mentioned in in your documentary in that small clip we just played that it's around 25 percent 
of black or minority ethnic football players in the top four leagues, but it's only about 3.3% who are actually in managerial positions. Why do you think that gap is so big? There's obviously a vast range of reasons. You'll hear if you go on terraces or speak to fans, some very simplistic ones being trotted out that the research is showing from the sports people's think tank is simply not true. I think unconscious bias is a huge thing. This is the idea that if you aren't aware of the way that you think and make decisions, you will instinctively recruit people who look like you, talk like you and sound like you, when actually that's not the best way to get good results as a coach or manager because you want people who think differently, who have different cultures and ideas and backgrounds. And also, quite simply, uh, it's not the best way to be. I think the really important thing to make clear in that gap, Richard, is it's not a simple case of all, all of football is racist. In, in fact, it's really, that, that's a far too simplistic explanation and it wouldn't even be right to say that all of football actively discriminates against black managers, but it's an idea of creating a pipeline to make it easier for young black coaches to encourage black players when leaving the game to see a future in coaching and management. And this goes on to back to Michael Johnson, which is he spent 10 or 15 years in the top two divisions of the game throughout much of his playing career. He's done every coach and management qualification possible. And he's now got a gig at Cardiff City in the under 21 side. But it took him years to just get to that point when he he's as qualified as you can get. And you can understand why other potential black managers and coaches look at what Jono's done and obviously they admire him for it but they they think well why should I bother as such and that's a huge problem. Okay so there are talks about the Rooney rule of some version of that being introduced into the UK they use it in the NFL what do you think about that and well first of all just tell us a little bit more about the Rooney rule and then give us your thoughts on whether it would work in the UK and, and in football. Well, I think the, the thing I should firstly make clear, because anyone who's done a bit of looking around my Twitter or might do after this in interest at what we're discussing, is that although I do a fair bit of communications work for the Sports People's Think Tank, which is an organisation that's campaigned on this issue, I'm speaking today just purely from my own individual viewpoint. And I would call for the Rooney Rule. I know a lot of people agree with that. Chris Hewton just the other day said it again and that picked up a fair bit of local press coverage which was good to see. The most important thing I would say about the Rooney Rule and you can see it on the additional clips on the playlist that I've created beyond the documentary, just short things, is Leon Mann actually says this, it's not giving a job to a black person because they are black. It is addressing these institutional barriers in the game such as unconscious bias um, such as the discrepancy in the statistics that you mentioned, by giving a black person an opportunity in an interview to impress someone who they wouldn't have got the chance to sit in front of. And I think most people in any career can relate to the fact that in an interview, you might not necessarily get that job, but if you, if you impress that decision maker, you can build a relationship that means that they might recommend you to another chairman or when they need a, an under 21s coach or a first team coach, six months a year later, they'll think of you where they wouldn't have otherwise met you. And I don't think that gets stressed enough. This is not positive action in a sense of someone deserving a job. It's just deserving a fair chance like everyone else. And getting one BME candidate into every, a minimum, into every interview scenario, for me is a must to start to create that change. And the success that it's had in America, I think, is testament to the fact that it's a good way to go. And in fairness to the the EFL, they've got a voluntary code this year with 10 clubs involved, built around a version of the Rooney Rule, which is promising signs going forward. Mm. So you are here representing yourself as a sports journalist, but you did mention yes. that you do work for the uh, Sports People's Think Tank. Tell us a little bit more about them. So the Sports People's Think Tank is essentially looking at the voices of sports people whilst they're in their careers because a lot of the time we see athletes you know they're concerned with their self-image but you, we rarely hear from athletes in terms of their opinions about their sport because often they're scared for for one reason or another to speak out and the sports people think tank 
broadly speaking, is about encouraging athletes to do that. And one of the main issues that it started out with, it's diversified significantly in recent years, was Michael Johnson, Leon Mann, Jason Roberts and Darren Moore, three of whom are, are ex-Premier uh, League players, and of course Leon's a, a leading sports journalist, were looking at the statistics that we've referred to and um, partnering with Dr. Stephen Bradbury to do a ton of sociology research year after year after year. They've just been back to Parliament, which I attended with the SPTT for the third time, the second time I've attended, to present that evidence to the governing bodies, to MPs, and try to stir more of a discussion to help create a climate of change and and basically speed up the pace of that change really in any way possible. Yeah, you've had those discussions. What's the next step now, Michael? Well, the problem with an issue like this is it's not just going to change in a year. One thing I would say that Michael Johnson said that really has stuck with me, and he said this on multiple occasions, is if you look at what women on boards did with the Davis report, they set a target they said in five years' time, and this was a while back now, it's well documented, we want, I believe it was 25%. Um, I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong. And they set that target of we want 25% of women on boards, which doesn't sound like much, but at the time that was a ginormous leap. And basically, in short, they did it. Because once you set a target, it gives people a more clearer goal than a year on year, oh, we'll try and keep things progressing and it's very difficult to measure. And if there's one thing I'd call for to create a unifying idea around which people can think of trying to create change, it would be to to try and maybe, to me, the logical target has always seemed to be to match the population level before we look at Premier League players, which the population is approximately 13% BME. And obviously, currently, the figures are about 3%. So matching the population would seem, or, or getting in and around that area would seem an ideal start to me. Yeah, I think that would be a good first step of getting a little bit closer to uh, what is needed. Michael McCann, it's been so great to get your thoughts on all of this. It's a really important topic. Um, where exactly can we watch the whole documentary and how can we continue to learn everything you know about this topic and football and sports in general on social media? Um, well, thank you very much for having me on. It's, I mean, it's always good to talk about it. So my Twitter handle is at this is McCann, McCann exactly as you'd expect it to be spelt, two C's, two N's. And if you head on to my YouTube as well, or just the, the easiest way, to be honest, is type in the ugly side of the beautiful game. And it should appear relatively high up on, on Google and have a look for yourself. Um, any coverage of this issue is always welcome because I, I don't see it enough in mainstream media, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, go and watch that. I've watched it myself. It's a really good piece. Michael McCann, the sports journalist, thank you for being on Sportachino this morning. Thank you very much, Richard. My pleasure. Well, if you missed any of that conversation, you can go back and listen to it on iTunes and on Stitcher. We create it as an audio podcast for you every single day that we are on the air. And what would be really good is if you helped us out by giving us a rating and review on iTunes. If you don't know how to do it, have a look at this video.
United, United. No, I'm a Liverpool fan, but never mind. I am giving away this book called The Class of 92, Out of Our League by Nicky Butt, Phil Neville, Gary Neville, Ryan Giggs and Paul Skulls. We gave it, a, well, we're giving it away now, but after we did a competition on the Facebook page to share the post. If you shared the post, you are in for a chance of winning this book. You know, pretty nice little read for you to have over Christmas. And I'm about to announce the winner. Drum roll, please. James, a little drum roll there. The winner is Amy Jane Beckett. Thanks to Amy for sharing the post entering the competition, and now winning the Class of 92 book. Congratulations to her. Now, of course, Gary Neville last season had a little stint as manager of Valencia. It didn't go very well for him, but we love talking about European football on this show. So let's have a look at some of the big games happening across the continent this weekend. Ah, we don't have it, but I will quickly tell you that it is Atletico Madrid versus Las Palmas, Sevilla versus Malaga, and it is the Spanish derby between Barcelona versus Espanyol. You've also got Juventus versus Roma in Italy's Serie A, and it is in the German Bundesliga. Tonight it's Hoffenheim versus Dortmund, and Nice face Dijon in League let us know your thoughts on any of those games. Okay, it is that time of the day. It's time for our sports health and fitness product review. James is concerned this isn't gonna taste very good. It is the Bounce Energy Ball Cacao Mint Protein Bomb. I said bomb. No, Joe, that's silly. That's silly. But never mind. It's a protein bomb. Cacao mint. A chewy mix of cacao ni nibs. What are nibs? Whey protein and sunflower seeds. High in antioxidant vitamin E, which contributes to the protection of cells from oxidative stress. No artificial preservatives. High protein and fiber, gluten free. That's what I'm talking about, baby. Um, let's have a look at the nutritional information. Per 40 gram ball, 20 grams of protein. That's what I like to see. 10 grams of, uh, oh no, 10% is, is sugars in the carbs. No, sorry, this is wrong. That's 20% is protein. It's 10 grams of, of um, protein, 7 grams of fat, 176 calories. All right, I'll pull that up. But, oh, that's because it's an energy ball. Oh, there we go. All right, let's see if it tastes any good. Let's see what it looks like. I'm intrigued to see what it looks like. It smells a bit funny. It smells a bit like a hospital, like a minty hospital. Here's what it looks like. It looks a bit funny as well. It's like a small, it's not a ball though. That's not a ball. What do you call that ball? <laughs> That's not a ball. If, if it was in half, it'd be a ball. It's a bit weird looking. It looks like a, a feast. You know the feast chocolate um, ice cream? It looks like one of them. Let's try it out. It doesn't taste like a feast. I now wish it was a feast. The mintiness is kind of like an odor, but it doesn't actually taste of mint. You can smell the mint. It... I'm not sure about this. Only 10 grams of protein as well. I thought it'd be more protein. Yeah. Apart from a bit of the, the tinge of the mint smell, it's a bit, little bit tasteless. Um, not that fun to eat. It's quite chewy, quite nutty. It's probably going to choke me for the end of the show. Um, I would never buy that. And I probably wouldn't eat it if it was on the side of a table and free to eat. That is the Bounce Energy Ball Cacao Mint Protein Bomb. We do have a link to it on our Amazon page. Click the link, try it out, buy it. 
we get a little bit of a kickback, let us know what you think. I would love to hear from you. See, I'm starting to choke already. All right, we've come towards the end of the show. Let's have a quick reminder of today's sports headlines. Brock Lesnar has been suspended for one year and given a $250,000 fine for failing a drugs test. Luis Suarez has signed a new contract at Barcelona, keeping him at the club until 2021. Zinedine Zidane is critical of FIFA's new video technology following their 2-0 win over Club America of Mexico in the Club World Cup. And the Seattle Seahawks clinch the NFC West with a 24-3 win over the Los Angeles Rams. So one thing we haven't discussed more in detail is about Brock Lesnar being banned for one year and a quarter of a million dollars after he tested positive for uh, anti-estrogen type drugs um, ahead of his fight against Mark Hunt at UFC 200. It was in a um, before training test and then it was also an uh, during an in-competition test as well around the time of the fight, which he won. He won't be able to fight again for the UFC until July, albeit he is still a performer with the WWE and should be in the WWE Royal Rumble. One other thing to mention is the excitement around the brand new United Kingdom Championship in the WWE. Unfortunately, it happened after I was chatting to Finley Martin yesterday on Sportachino. Would have loved to get his thoughts on that event. It's in Blackpool. Have a look at that. That should be fascinating. It's going to be filmed over the weekend of January 14th and 15th. Really exciting to happen there. What do you think? Have they picked some of the best UK talent? I would love to get your thoughts on all of that. Tom Scarborough, he's just joined the show. I'm sure he'll be very interested in popping along to that, one of the best UK referees in the country. Um, really exciting development for wrestling in the UK. It is really burgeoning right now. We've also got the World of Sports special happening over the Christmas period on ITV. Good friend of mine, Steve Linsky, involved in that. Have a look at that when you see it. Look in your Radio Times if you're still a Radio Times user and find out when that will be on your telly box. One thing which won't be on your telly box for the next three weeks is Sportuccino. We are taking a Christmas break. I'm going to try and get some sleep. Getting up at this early morning every single day is exhausting. But don't worry, I will be re relaxing and then I will be refreshed, ready for 2017. January the 9th, put it in your diary, Sportuccino will be returning every single weekday morning from 8am GMT on Periscope, on Facebook, on YouTube, continuing the conversation on Twitter as an audio podcast on iTunes and on Stitcher. And this is your show. Get involved. Let me know what you like, what you don't like, what sports you want to talk about, what sports you don't want us to talk about. Oh, I'm feeling the protein bomb coming towards the end of the show. And anyway, I would love to hear all about that from you. If I don't see you before then, have a wonderful Christmas and New Year. We're back January the 9th on Sportuccino. For all of you who have been involved with the show, watching the show, thanks for being a part of Sportuccino in 2016. I'll see you in the new year. Goodbye.